welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free, and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting the Tough Girl Podcast and signing up as a patron, please check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. There's currently 222 patrons who are supporting the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. Take action now and become one of them. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated page on the Tough Girl website or female patrons five dollars and above are invited to join the closed Facebook group the Tough Girl Tribe. Today I'm delighted we're speaking to Mel Nichols a Paralympian endurance and adventure athlete and a hand cycle le jog which is land's end to John O'Groats world record holder. Mel lives a life of adventure and is inspiring others to believe that anything is possible. Mel starts by telling us more about her childhood. I was lucky to live in the country. I'm the middle child of three and me probably more than my brother or sister, um, although we all love being outside. So I'd spend as much time as I could outside, whether it's making dens and building nature gardens in the woods behind my house, uh, going off with the dogs and, and jumping them over cross country fences from the, the horse show over the, over the back fields. Um, I'd be, be out with my own horse I had from sort of the age of 10. that I Well, I, I looked after all the people's horses so I always wanted a horse, but my parents said, obviously, I, I couldn't have one until I could afford it myself. So I'd spend every moment I could before and after school looking after other people's horses. So I'd be cleaning up the fields, mucking them out, mucking out the horses, uh, riding them for them, just so that I could be out there with them and, and outside. And my bike as well was was a, a main feature. It was either a, a sort of an adventure myself. So my friends and I, we, we'd um, leave my house and we'd, we'd decide to turn right at the first road, left at the next one, right at the next one, left at the next one, and never really have a plan where we were going to go, just sort of go off on, on adventures. And it was also a, a means to get to the horses. So the, the horses, they featured highly in my, my childhood and I was growing up. But for me, it was about being outside. I sort of came in when I got dragged back in by my mum for tea really and then as I got older I was more into sort of um, adventure sports so climbing abseiling um, mountain biking that kind of thing what did you want to do when you grew up like did you have like a plan or a vision for your life yeah I always wanted to be a vet when I grew up <laughs> um, school was okay um, I did okay at school but I just wanted to be outside so I didn't want to stay on for A levels and sort of early on in my school life, I kind of realised that perhaps being a vet, you know, wasn't going to be quite the path um, that I that I wanted. And I had this vision that I was going to uh, grow up, live on a farm, be a vet, get married to a farmer <laughs> and have two plats. Well, I've got the plats, but that's probably about it. <laughs> and so, yeah, I didn't want to stay. I didn't want to do A-levels. I wanted to be outside. So my actual route, um, I'd heard about Hartbury College down in Gloucestershire. That was or is an agriculture and equine college. So I'd heard that I could go and study there and it was kind of um, eventually I wanted to go and do my degree there. But to get to the degree, then I needed to do A levels or the equivalent of um, and because I didn't want to stay at school. Then I actually left school just I think I was not quite 16 um, because my birthday is in July and um, went off to Hartbury College in se- that September, um, moved out of home and um, started a, a course in equine business management. So the equivalent of A levels, which basically later uh, took me on to study my equine science degree at Hartbury. Oh, fantastic. And what happened next? What happened next? Um, I left Hartbury after my degree and and got a job, um, just like everybody else, just needed to pay back some some money, pay back some student loans. And it, it was actually not long after I left Hartbury that I had my first stroke. Do you just want to share a little bit more about what happened? Because I believe it was like really out of the blue. I was living with a friend of mine and um We'd been out to the pub the night before, as you do, and and had a few drinks and just had a normal sort of fun. I think it was like a Tuesday night. (laughs) It sounds a bit mad going out to the, well, perhaps not mad, perhaps normal. Not when you're a student. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Um, And I was in work. I was was working in an accounts office and I went in to make two cups of tea, one for me and one for my boss. And I had these two cups of tea in front of me and instantly the two cups became four cups. And I just had complete double vision. And I remember thinking, you know, wondering if I was going to faint because it was it was a summer. It was quite hot. And I kind of waited until that sort of blurry feeling came and, and anything else. And it didn't. And it was just this complete double vision of everything. And I found my way back to my boss's office to tell her, you know, what happened. 
And then as soon as as, as that happened, um, I, I remember sort of weird things happening, like my eyes started blinking uncontrollably and I, I couldn't control it. I couldn't stop it. I tried to sort of tell her um, what had happened and, and she knew I'd been out the night before. So she sort of laughed at me. She said, oh, you know, you've got a hangover, you're drunk or something. And then as my eyes sort of started doing this crazy stuff, she, she screamed, <laughs> um, <laughs> which wasn't so helpful. Um, and apparently my eyes kind of rolled back in my head. And a lot of things happened from there. And, and basically I was taken to hospital and after... After a while, I mean, um, to begin with, um, my housemate was called in by the doctors and he was pulled to one side and grilled and said, what have you given her? You've, you've given her drugs. And he was like, of course I haven't. And, you know, he hadn't. And they said, you know, if you were if you were 80, I'd have said you've had a stroke, but you can't have done. And later that night I had an MRI scan and they came back and said, oh, actually, we're sorry. Yes, you have. I suppose you've probably asked this question. Is there a reason why it happened? Because you're so young for that to happen. At the time, they said, because I was on the pill, they said, oh, it's, that's why. You know, it's easy to find reasons why, if, if you can fit some into a box. So that was, that was they said, it must be because of that. So, you know, stop taking the pill, which obviously I did. And then it happened a year later as well. And I wasn't on the pill. So that time it was, it was sort of said, um, oh, it's migraines or it's just bad luck. How did you continue living your life? Because that must have been such a tough time period to be to be going through you, you're living your best life you, you've left home you're at college you've, you've got a job you're working you're doing what you should be doing how did you cope with the uncertainty it was really really hard it was hard for me and it was hard for my family especially my mum um I suppose I mean we never really got on that well when we lived at home but as soon as I moved out of home typically you know we we mum miss me I miss my mum and I guess with her not not being there she perhaps felt that she couldn't look after me you know she wasn't doing what she wanted to do out of that we fought quite a lot because she was scared and I was scared so yeah it was it was definitely hard I just I didn't know I didn't understand what had happened I didn't know if it was going to happen again um I'd sort of go to sleep or not go to sleep that night and think you know what's what's going to happen tonight is is it going to happen again and because you don't expect it you know it's it's a it's a crazy thing to happen to a 20 early 20 year old then yeah, it's quite a frightening place to be really. And I had to leave my job. I ended up retraining as a holistic therapist at the time and then sports therapist. But that sort of time leading up to that, you know, when you, when I can't go to work, I couldn't do what I was doing anymore. Um, I had to rethink and, and change everything. I could walk, but I walked with a walking stick for quite a while. And whenever I'd sort of overdone things and I really knew about it. So I, I had to pace myself. I couldn't be going out drinking every night. I couldn't, I couldn't be living the life that I was perhaps living quite before. Your third stroke in, in 2008, that, I don't want to say that was the big one, but that, that was, you know, that sort of, well, you share what happened with that one. Yeah, I mean, it had been a, a long time since since my previous two strokes. And, um, you know, I had recovered, I'd recovered probably about 70%. And nobody really knew about my strokes, unless I'd really overdone things. And I'd walk a bit more wobblier, and I'd, I'd slur my words a bit more. But normally, I, I kind of, you know, I'd retrained, I'd got my own business, I'd gone to other other jobs. You know, I, I was running, I was uh, training for my first half marathon. So I got back to my normal life, you know, I had two jobs, I had two horses, and life was great again. And yes, certainly didn't see anything coming like that at all. It was about 10 days before my stroke. I was on my way to my horses and I got hit um, head on in my car. A van was coming on, in the opposite direction and it was a very narrow lane um, with high hedges. And basically he was on the wrong side of the road and he couldn't see me because of my car being lower. So I'd had this head on car accident and I did come away from that. My car was written off, sadly, but I was kind of okay um, I wasn't okay but I kind of was okay and then 10 days later I was I'd just come back from work and I was in my flat and I was about to to leave and, and go out to the horses again and I remember sort of um standing in the hallway and, and I always had my my phone with me that was on the radiator next to me and I, I grabbed my car keys and I went to walk and I don't really remember quite what happened but it was something really bizarre and it wasn't it wasn't like a it was like I'd cross-wired in, in my brain so I, I went to walk and something really random happened instead of me walking and I suddenly thought well this isn't right and I because of what happened before I kind of knew so I remember kind of trying to test it again think you know take another step and whatever it was that happened that shouldn't have happened it was it was really strange and I think I I knew and I was on my own in my flat and I just thought well if I don't get help you know I could be in real trouble now so my vision started to go but I knew where my phone was because I always put it there so I, I remember dialing two nines having to think about you know should I do this and 
as much as I remember after that, I obviously did dial the other nine. Uh, and then later the uh, paramedics came and took me to hospital. I guess I kind of knew that I'd had a, another stroke. I, I thought that was ha- what was happening. Um, when I sort of came to in hospital, obviously I was told that that's what had happened. This time I was in hospital for a long, long time, a good few months. And this, this stroke would affected me differently, although it affected my left side, which the other two had previously as well. It also affected my mobility more. So I couldn't walk anymore. Um, I kind of had this weird thing that my body would throw me over to the right. And um, and I just I couldn't use my left leg. I, I couldn't use much of my left arm. And I'd have kind of these sort of seizure activity as well. And so I was in hospital a long time and I was in the stroke unit um, a, a lot of that time. And actually it was uh, it was the summer again and um, there wasn't a lot to do, obviously, whilst in hospital um, other than watch TV. So I was watching uh, Wimbledon. Um, it was the the year of the, the epic match between uh, Federer and Nadal, one of the many years of the epic matches that went on for absolute, felt like days. Um, so that kept me entertained. And then afterwards we, we had the Olympics because it was 2008 and then the Paralympics. And I'd never... I'd never really known much about the Paralympics before. Um, it'd never really been on my radar. And I guess there wasn't really any coverage on TV. But I remember watching uh, the, the Paralympics, the Beijing Paralympics. And just I I didn't know when I was going to recover. You know, I'd had two strokes before and I kind of had recovered. So I just assumed that I would. But I didn't know how long it would take. And I was actually um, entered for an adventure race, uh, a two day adventure race coming up in a, a couple of weeks. And I remember calling from my hospital bed, sort of saying um, that I probably won't be there in a couple of weeks, but just to, to hold my place open. <laughs> so I had my plans, you know, to get back to, to training and get back to my my races that I was training for and, and things like that. But watching the Beijing Paralympics, I remember just watching these athletes and and just being so impressed by their determination and their passion for their sport. And it was nothing to do with disability or or what they couldn't do or what they didn't have. It just made me think a bit differently that, okay, well, whilst I can't walk, whilst I can't run, whilst I can't ride my bike, there's stuff I can do. And that's awesome. But it just made me think, well, you know, I'm not going to sit here and and wait till I'm better. I'm going to do something now. So I think that was, well, I know that was definitely the the spark for me to to sit and to think about what I could do and to start making my own plans, which which I did literally from my hospital bed. What plans did you make? And how did you make your dreams a reality? So for me, it was just a case of, you know, how can I love being fit? I love being active. So how can I do that? So yes, I can join a swimming group because I like swimming. Yes, there's a, there was a basketball team in Gloucester where I was living that, that I could join. That was my first sport that I sort of took part in. But again, it wasn't to be an athlete. It was for me at the time, it was to get back sort of social circles. I guess just be active and have fun, meet new people, that kind of thing. And also very much me in hospital, I was sort of planning a a big journey. I remember my my dad coming in and telling me about uh, he'd been doing some family history and one of his ancestors, I think it was his great, great grandfather, I think it was. He had a a brother and there was a story of him, how he was kind of this, um, as the family see this, this adventurer. And he was actually lost at sea coming back from the Falkland Isles. And it sort of really sort of lit up that spark in me again. And it was like, you know, I'd love to take on this grand adventure. And I wasn't allowed to drive for three years after my last stroke. So I thought, well, you know, I can't I can't drive, but I can't ride my bike. But there must be ways that I can kind of make this journey. So I guess I'd, I'd, I'd started thinking about these, you know, human powered journeys that I wanted to take on at some point. And then actually, once I got out of hospital and a, a lot further down from my recovery, um, I got into sports and it was the sport side rather than the adventure side that kind of took over my life for a while. T- tell us more about some of those special moments or those special memories from representing Great Britain, because you've represented Great Britain at the Europeans, at the World Championships, um, at the, the Paralympic Games in London 2012. What what are the moments or the, the main few moments that stand out for you? Oh, there are so many, so many. I mean, I mean you say, yeah, I represented Great Britain. Um, I did, and, and it didn't happened just like that Uh, wheelchair racing was one of the the first sports that I I tried and I was quite annoying that that I'd kind of just research on the internet every sport that I could find that I could possibly have a go at and wheelchair racing was one of them and there was a come and try day up in Leeds and because I wasn't allowed to drive I said to my friend oh do you fancy a road trip we're going to go to Leeds and have a look at this wheelchair racing so she she kindly she was like yeah yeah why not um so we went up and I I tried it and I enjoyed it but I, I didn't know anything about wheelchair racing I knew of David Weir and Tanny Gray Thompson doing the London a marathon and I also knew that they trained kind of like twice a day you know for miles and miles on the road and that wasn't what I was interested in but because I used to run after work around the block I thought well I could get a, a racing wheelchair and this could be my 
uh, you know, instead of running around the block. I didn't really think much more of it than that. Other than I, I just really enjoyed it. I met up with my coach uh, through, again, meeting at a, a conference, sporting conference that I went to. And from then we kind of, you know, I, I went to training, I trained more. And um, he obviously saw something in me that, that I didn't know about. That was in 20 end of 2010 I think I tried first try wheelchair racing and 2011 we we ended up going to competitions around Europe because to progress in the sport to get to the right level then you need to get the experience you need to to race the right people within your class because for Paralympic Paralympic sport you're in classification for your impairment so it's getting to the right competitions getting on the right tracks getting in the right races and we le- both learned together like that and we knew that there was a very, very, very small chance, perhaps, uh, of me qualifying for London 2012. But, you know, I hadn't been in the sport very long at all. And I was a complete dark horse. I wasn't on the British team. There were a good 50 people um, or so that were on the team that, that should be going to London. And there's about 50 spaces uh, for the whole of the athletics Paralympic team. So the chances, you know, were very, very small, but there was a chance. You know, from early on, I've I've had this, my motto is dream big. And um, I never said it sort of outwardly to anyone, but my dream was to get to London. And through working just both of us, I mean, we worked so hard. We, we went everywhere we needed to get. And um, my coach would drive us around, around Europe to get to these competitions. And about a month before London, I got the phone call from the head coach at um, UK Athletics to tell me that I'd been selected for Great Britain um, at London 2012. So that was going to be my first major championship, first major competition. What a way to, to enter the world <laughs> of competition. You know, London Absolutely. 2012. What was that like? Oh, it was amazing. Um and I say my motto is dream big and I had this dream and that's where I wanted to be and that's where I focused and worked so, so hard for. But actually, uh, it was kind of a lesson to myself because I'd focused to, to get to that point, but I never really thought past that point. So the moment I was selected, you know, it was fantastic and I was so happy. I told my family and then it kind of dawned on me what, what this meant. And I had a bit of a meltdown <laughs> because I hadn't thought about, you know, now what happened? Yes, yes, my dream was to get selected. I've done that. Now what? For a good couple of weeks, I just felt that I wasn't worthy. You know, I shouldn't be going. I hadn't been in the sport long enough. I wasn't an athlete. Um, a real sort of crisis of confidence. And it took a good couple of weeks with my coach and, and the team to kind of get me through that. But then once we sort of went away for holding camp and led into, into the games, then I was right back to where I needed to be. You know, I was going there for experience. I wasn't expected to medal. It was to learn. Um, and it was such a an amazing, amazing experience for me to be, you know, your first Paralympic Games, being at home games, being at London. I'm I'm just I'm so lucky that I was able to be part of that yeah what was your race of choice what were you doing not of choice sadly <laughs> for Paralympic sport I say you get given your events for London it was the 100 and 200 meters so it's sprints I've never been a sprinter and I never will be a sprinter so to, to race th- those kind of distances was definitely going to be a lot a lot more challenging for me um, I'm more of a diesel engine so once I sort of get going I'll keep going but I just take a lot uh, quite a big effort to get going particularly for me because I'm very one-sided from my stroke so my right side is the side that works so for to, to race 100 meters whilst everybody is halfway down the track my right arm is is doing everything and I'm kind of a lot further back from everybody else uh, and my brain being a little bit slower to to react to as well so yeah so 100 and 200 meters and and my 200 uh, meter race was my better race I remember sort of memory of of, um, my heat of my 100 meter race the the first race I did there and I was coming out of the under the tunnel of of the um, Paralympic Stadium I wasn't even quite in the stadium. And I remember just hearing my name being called, you know, by, by, I don't know who it was. And I remember thinking, you know, who's calling my name? How do they know I'm here? And I came out and it was like a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning or something. You know, nobody should have been there. Everybody should, should have been at work. And the stadium was packed out. And I was the only Brit in the stadium at that time. And it was the most incredible feeling. Before I went in, I thought, you know, what if I'm so scared? What if I freeze up? What if I can't move my arms? And it was the most friendliest feeling I've ever experienced. It was, you know, 80,000 people in that stadium and every single one of them felt like my friends. It was amazing. To finish that race, it didn't matter whether you finished first or when you finished last or whatever. The support from the home crowd and to be there, it was just it was just the best feeling. Absolutely. So tell me more about racing in the London Marathon. 
London Marathon is the the greatest of all marathons, as far as I'm concerned. Again, it, it's London. It's where my my Paralympic, where my sporting career began, and the support that you get from from the people of London for is just immense. You know, as a wheelchair racer, we start slightly earlier than than the the runners, um, but you're out on the streets and people are there supporting you, and it was oh, it's the most amazing feeling. If uh, I don't know if you've uh, run London Marathon before, I have. I've done, I've done it oh, quite a few times. Had. So it's yeah, amazing. It, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I would recommend anybody, you know, to to do this. And a lot of people say to me, I could never run a marathon. Yes, you could. You know, it's all in your head, isn't it? And it doesn't matter how fast you go, but just to be able to experience that and to be, and to be able to do London Marathon, if you can, then absolutely anyone just go out there and do it. Um, so for me, yeah, it's definitely, definitely my favourite marathon of all. I've had my my personal best from London. But it's not a it's not a fast course. It's not an easy course as a wheelchair racer. But maybe it's something about it being in London that really kind of lifts you to to get that best performance for me my best performance so far came last year when it was that really really hot year and again probably for us we start a little bit earlier so uh, we didn't perhaps have the the hottest of the day and equally when you're rolling along um, then you get that kind of uh, cool air so that's probably quite good for us I work particularly well in the heat so things sort of seem to come together for me although the the conditions were good for me I was in a situation that um, last year I had to I had to stop my racing career quite early in the year because I was waiting for some heart surgery. Um, I had heart surgery uh, just after my last stroke because it turned out that my heart was the reason I was having strokes, or so they thought. So I, in, in uh, 2009, I had some surgery and all had been really well since. And then the last couple of years, I'd noticed uh, another problem with my heart, an electrical fault. And this this problem was getting worse and worse the more I pushed myself, the more I pushed my body, the more I raced. And although I still could race and I would always finish a race, it wasn't great for my body. It wasn't leaving me in a a very good way at all. And it was a really um, it was quite a frightening place to be as well. So for London 2018, I remember getting to the start and I went to do my warm up and my heart just kicked off straight away and I couldn't do a warm up at all. And I thought, well, this is no good. You know, I can't I can't race a marathon with my heart sort of doing 240 beats per minute You know, before I even started. I thought, you know, should I should I really go? Should I really start this marathon? What's the sensible thing to do? And of course, you know, I'm an athlete, I'm a racer. So I sort of decided that, well, I'll start. I'll just take the first first mile at a time, you know, do, do one mile, do 5K, do 10K. And that's kind of how I set off. I took it really steady. I paced it the whole way. My heart was, you know, 235, 240 beats per minute the whole way. But I just cruised it. I didn't once sort of push it until, until I got to the last kilometre, I think. My last K I sprinted. And I managed to get my PB. So <laughs> that was a tough year. But I was so happy that I was able to finish that race because I was so close to not even starting it. And it, performance wise, it, it, you know, it wasn't the best situation. It wasn't um, it wasn't as hard as I could have pushed at all. But to be able to get that time to be able to finish, to be OK in those conditions, then that meant a lot to me. You must have immense upper body strength. Well, it could always be better. <laughs> I'm working on it. Do you, do you train in the gym at all? Are you doing like pull-ups? Yeah, I, I train in the gym uh, about three days a week. Yeah, six days a week I train and that's between the road and my race chair, on, on my hand bike. So turbo training, uh, roller training, but also in the gym as well. So try and do a good sort of two really good heavy strength sessions um, and one perhaps more mobility and um, sort of prehab kind of stuff. Let's talk about Hand Cycle Britain, Land's End to John O'Groats, the world record attempt. Where did this idea come from? Well, hand cycling came into my life but just after 2012. So obviously I was a wheelchair racer. I am a wheelchair racer, but I've, I've always loved cycling. I've still actually got my mountain bike up in my spare room. Um, I still can't part with it. <laughs> I know I'll never ride it again, but I just don't want to let it go. So bikes have always featured really highly in my life. And I was recovering from a shoulder injury after 2012. And I was in the gym on a, on a hand crank machine. And again, I, you know, I just I hate being inside. I want to be outside. By then I knew of a hand cycle. So I asked my physio, if I could get a get my own handbike that meant I could do my physio outside and actually um you know rather than sort of facing a wall or a tv screen in a gym so she said that I could do that as long as I wasn't going to race it <laughs> <laughs> my handbike became a you know really important part of my training it was great cross training because it, it works the opposite muscles that I was working in my racing wheelchair it was also great for recovery and great for any kind of injury pre- prevention and stuff like that. But it was also gave me another level of freedom, you know, that I, I couldn't get perhaps from my racing chair because your racing chair, it's not built for comfort. You can't go anywhere in it. So having the handbike, it meant that I could I could go out 
wherever I wanted to go. You know, I, I could go out with my friends if I wanted to. I could go out. I, later years, I'd pack my tent and my camping stuff on the back and go off for sort of multi-day journeys and things like that. It also led to, in after Rio, then I moved on to the British team with British Cycling. So I, I raced uh, my handbike on the paracycling team for Great Britain. So it's become my career, but it's also become a lot more than that. With that adventure side that I talked about way back when I was in hospital, whenever I had the chance away from my sport, so during my off time, which was normally during the winter because obviously athletic season is is during the summer months, then I would take my bike and, and I'd I test myself in a, in a different way than I would in my sport. So whether that's trying to cycle up a, a mountain pass on, on one of the Scottish islands or over in, in um, Lanzarote or cycle, circumnavigate again an island or something, then I'd, I'd sort of just try and challenge myself. And my bike, as I always, always featured really heavily with that, which led on to my most recent or my most recent challenges, I suppose. Tell us more about Hand Cycle Britain. So Hand Cycle Britain came about... Basically, I wanted to I wanted to bring my performance mindset, my performance experience from Paralympic sport into my world of adventure. And last year, whilst I whilst I couldn't race because of my I was waiting for my heart surgery, I had some time off during the, the, the later summer months, which I hadn't had before. So I thought, well, OK, I can't train. I can't race, but I can still I can still ride my bike. I can still push myself in a slightly different way. So I used the time and I headed off to the Faroe Islands, which were a place that I knew a little about, but not very much, uh, which was a massive draw for me to to go and find out more. It was a place that I was told that however much uh, research I did, I was told that cycling wasn't possible on the Faroe Islands. As far as I'm concerned, the only way to find out what is possible is to find out what is possible. So I headed out there, just me and my bike, loaded up with my tent and my stove and, and everything I would need for about a month on the road and attempted to, to solo hand cycle the 18 islands of the Faroe Islands. That was a massive, massive learning experience and the most incredible experience for me. But it kind of brought me very much into you know, what I can do in the world of adventure. And so Hand Cycle Britain this year was blending the two. So bringing the performance side, the racing side into the adventure side. So you set yourself this goal to complete uh, Land's End to John O'Groats, 874 miles, looking to beat the female Guinness World Record and the male Guinness World Record um, which is 11 days for the female, 10 days for the male. So wanting to complete it in nine days. Tell us what it was like being on the start line, ready to set off on this grueling challenge. My theory of, of nine days really was was that I knew that I could cycle for 100 miles in one day. I, I've cycled you know, over 100 miles in one day. And so although I, I'd never ridden multi days of over 100 miles just because I hadn't had the, the the time or the situation to do that but I figured well if I can ride 100 miles for one day then I could ride 100 miles the next day and and so on and obviously I didn't actually know if I could I'd never done that before so that nine days although you know way back nine months ago when I was planning it I thought yes that's possible as I got closer to the time yet again as as I did with with London I kind of had this big crisis of confidence and thought nine days who thinks they can do this in nine days you know it's never been done if I just pick this number out of the sky or something and good friends had sort of said you know that's that's a, a bonkers idea you know thinking you can do it in nine days so I didn't know at all on that start line I didn't know if it was possible I knew I could get I could ride day one I thought I could ride day two but other than that I had no idea so being on that start line the night before I didn't sleep at all my body was just kind of already in racing mode it was twitching it was it was ready to go my heart rate was sky high before I'd even sort of again got in my bike we were down at Land's End and my plan was to, to start riding from about half past four as soon as it got light. But it typically the, the week that I picked was hopefully going to be the best week. It was the longest daylight hours. It was summer. It was it was June leading up to the longest day. But actually, it was a week of horrific storms, <laughs> a lot of rain. So on, on that morning, we waited uh, for it to get light. and it, it didn't really get light. It just we were there until I think I set off at about 10 to 5 in the end. And it was still very, very dark and very wet. But yeah, the, the adrenaline, I suppose, the fear of starting as soon as I was on my bike and I was into that race mode again, then that side just disappeared. And I was completely where I wanted to be in my happy place riding my bike. It was actually quite funny because the support team that were in um, a car behind me, They'd never ridden with me, but they'd never seen me ride my bike before. So uh, once I was I was off the uh, the start line, they jumped in the car to follow me, and they tell me they actually couldn't find me because 
but uh, they thought I'd gone the wrong way because they couldn't see me. So they went off down a different road to try and find me and, and realised I hadn't. I just got that far ahead because I was literally straight in race mode. <laughs> I was gone. <laughs> oh, amazing. Epic. And how did it go? Like, what was the biggest challenge during those nine days? The weather was definitely quite challenging, but I'd, I'd done a lot of work beforehand. Obviously, I'd, I'd trained a lot, but I'd also tried to train my mind a lot, which I've done in, in previous races and things. And the, the mind you know, is such so, so powerful. It could be your biggest enemy, but it can also be your, your greatest ally. The weather was not something I could control. And a few people had said to me before, you know, if the weather's really awful, have you got alternative dates you can do or something? And I was like, well, no, you know, the, the team that are supporting me, we've only got this block of time. So whatever the weather, we're going to get out there. We're going to get it done. And on the bike, it was kind of OK, because I guess I was I was just in that mindset of just just riding my bike, just doing what I do. I think for me, it was off the bike that I found the hardest whilst I was on the bike. What, however slow I was going, however hard the conditions were, however steep the hills were, I was moving forwards. And that was really important. I was moving closer to, to my goal. But as soon as I was off the bike, I needed to be off the bike to eat or to recover or to sleep or anything like that. But as soon as I was off the bike, then I wasn't moving forward anymore. And and that was the time that my body kind of started fighting back at me. Um, And also the demons definitely sort of started creeping into my mind. And overnight when I wasn't sleeping and the rain was coming down and the wind was blowing, I'd I'd start thinking, well, what if I can't get out there tomorrow? What if I can't climb up shack in this storm or something like that? So I think for, you know, for me, it was definitely off the bike that was the hardest. Let's talk a little bit more about your performance mindset, training your mind, dealing with those demons. How do you train your mind? What is your performance mindset? I think in my throughout my career, then I've learned a lot of, of that sort of side. Um, you know, with London, obviously being the most incredible experience, but also I was very early. I was very new to the sport. I was in. I'd been racing fifteen months when I went to London, and nothing prepared me for that side of things. I remember I did have a bit of a meltdown at London because I thought at one point that I'd just let everybody down. I let my family down. It was a pretty tough time that I that I went through for that sort of half a day, I suppose it was, when I was in a bit of a state. But I learned from that that actually being that that way that I was wasn't wasn't helpful. It wasn't going to help me get to my next race and be in the best best um, position to race and to perform. So from there, I kind of, you know, I've done a lot of work with my with my sports with sports psych and leading into world championships, uh, which was my greatest achievement on the track I did a lot of work with sports psych because I was actually out uh, of training for quite a while with an injury and I'd only been back in a short time so at the time I couldn't train my body as much as I'd um, planned to as I wanted to but I knew that I could train my mind so I trained my mind through mindfulness through a certain amount of meditation and about all about being present and just to, to be in that best place for that I could with my head uh, if I wasn't for my body and I know that my sort of my best achievement on the track was definitely one through my mind rather than anything else without doubt so I kind of I knew that I could do that and and it was just about tapping into that again and using that out on the road on on hand cycle Britain what was the record that you got how long did it take you to complete the hand cycle Britain so I started at about I think it was 10 to 5 on the Thursday morning and I bet it came in at John O'Groats at 3 11 I think it was on the when oh and the following Thursday morning so my time was six days 22 hours and 18 minutes wow you absolutely (laughs) destroyed that record what wow six days and 22 hours is insane because you said you 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 know you knew you could do the first day 100 miles on the first day you knew you could possibly do the second day but you would never done the consecutive days what was like a typical day like were you were you pushing throughout the whole day I mean how many hours were you on the road for how much sleep were you getting I I planned I think to be cycling probably for about 10 hours a day so that would be actually cycling and then I'd have like a couple of breaks within that as well and I planned to to ride about 100 miles a day that was always my ideal and then as from from day one even though the weather was you know pretty horrific and I'd be getting through three sets of cycling well everything kit you know I was soaked from my waterproofs down to my bones um sort of over and over every every day so I sort of get getting through these changes of clothes but even so that the miles just came kind of fast I suppose <laughs> um it was it was great what was it like every single day was it what did you were you following quite strict routines or is it just more of a case of just go with the flow and see what happened each and every day 
My plan was always going to be to get a good block of riding in really early. So start around half past four, get a block in before the first rush hour, stop for breakfast, get a second block, stop for lunch, get a third block and then get a smaller block at the end of the day. From day one, as soon as I started riding, the miles just came a bit quicker than I expected, which was great. So I found that I could do, I I think I I planned to do either 50 kilometres or four hours each block, whichever came first. And obviously hoping that was always going to be the 50 kilometres. But with some of the, the areas like Devon and Cornwall being so hilly, that could take, you know, climbing on a handbike takes a long time. But actually, the the miles came a lot quicker. Those sort of 50 kilometres turn into a good 60 kilometres each morning before breakfast. So that was sort of a bit bigger chunk done. So then I'd stop for for the rush hour, stop for breakfast or second breakfast, as it usually was. And then I'd get out and I'd I'd aim for my second block would be the biggest block of the day. So I'd always try and get around 80 kilometres in at that point. I stopped for another lunch break. And then it was almost I learned that I could do three blocks a day rather than the four. And so the last block I kind of got in my head was almost like the warm down. And it might still be a good sort of 70, 80 kilometers. But sort of, again, using my taking over on my brain, really, is just sort of telling myself, you know, I've got a warm up block. I've got a main block. I've got a warm down, a warm down block. And I never once thought about the finish because I didn't know, you know, that that I could finish it. I didn't know what time I could do it in, but it was very much about managing expectations. So I didn't even think about the end of that day. I didn't think about 100 miles. I just thought about that block that I was in and I kind of used it almost like I do in the gym when I've got my, my sets to do. And I knew that I had, you know, three sets a day. That worked out to about, I think it was 25 sets for the entire challenge. So I'd count down each set that I'd done, which kind of helped me manage that a little bit, really. I was finishing earlier than I'd expected as well. So I thought if I could just chip off a little bit extra every day, then that would help me for, you know, the when the weather was so awful and if there was a time that I just couldn't carry on or if I had a, a mechanical or if there was a problem with navigation or something, then I had a little bit of a buffer to, to use. Yeah, which obviously really helped. Do you know what the next adventure is going to be? I have an idea what I'd like it to be. <laughs> Hand Soccer Britain was absolutely incredible. And it was about breaking the world record, which thankfully I smashed. But it was about a lot more, you know, it was, it was about that journey. It was about, for me, it was just being on my bike, um, traveling through Great Britain was incredible, you know, representing Great Britain in my sport, uh, representing Great Britain as a as a Ordnance Survey Get Outside ambassador as well. You know, it's about how great our country is. It's about, you know, getting out there, getting on your bike, getting active um, and meeting everybody along the way as well. The support I had on the road was incredible, whether that was people in cars, um, you know, tooting and waving, people on the side of the road with signs and stuff. It was amazing. And I was got I, I guess I was just sad that I couldn't kind of stop for every person and, and chat and and the campsites we stayed on you know I couldn't kind of spend more time there because it was a race you know I had to get to the end as fast as possible but for me it was very much about being out there and, and being on my bike as well and I was actually really sad because I didn't want to stop I didn't want to get off my bike I didn't want to stop riding like if, if I could have done I would have turned around and, and cycled back down the other way as well if uh, everyone didn't have somewhere to be <laughs> so I think the next challenge has got to perhaps be somewhere with just a bit more land hand cycle America you heard it here <laughs> first <laughs> is that it did I guess right <laughs> I haven't made definite plans, I suppose, of where it's going to be. Uh, these kind of projects, as you know, just take so much building, take a lot of a lot of money, a lot of um, stuff to organise and stuff. So, yeah, if I if I could get if I could get some backing, well, <laughs> the world is our oyster. Can you go off road on the with the hand cycles? Not with this one. Uh, this my bike is a, a ra- road race bike. It's about four four inches off the road. So even things like sort of uh, uneven tarmac or tree roots or anything, you do sort of, or speed bumps particularly, <laughs> that you, you kind of ground out on. So yeah, you, and the tyres are like 22 millimetres wide. So not suitable for off-roading at all, sadly. But you can get off-road handbikes. And that is something else that I'm looking at with someone. I have We have a, a challenge um, ready to go. And sadly, I just need a, an off-road handbike to be able to do this particular challenge, which would be epic. And I think probably would be a world first potential world record as well but you know with another bike it's it's more money and it's somewhere to put it so <laughs> those few things have to be sorted out first how, how much is a hand bike just roughly uh, about thirteen thousand pounds about 11 to thirteen thousand. wowzers got you okay mm. so now what i want to do now is just ask you some sort of quick fire questions my questions may be quick fire but you know you don't have to <laughs> my answer, friend might not be quickly. so yeah exactly right are you ready ready are you a tea or coffee person? Tea, always. Powered by tea. Morning or evening? Evening. Ooh, what time do you go to bed? <laughs> Never. <laughs> uh, I'm not very good at sleeping, which actually went in my favour on Hansog of Britain because I could power through with minimal sleep. 
So I think last night I was up writing until about two in the morning. And what time do you get up in the morning? It depends what I need to be up for, but I can happily be up at <laughs> probably an hour later or wherever I need to be. I'm I'm a bit like a giraffe, I think. They have like giraffe naps. They have naps often, but not for very long. So I can just put my head down 10 minutes and I'm away again. <laughs> wow. Do you have like power naps during the day? Sometimes if I get a chance to, yeah, I can go a few days and then think, right, I need I need half an hour and then, then, then back up again. What do you do to relax? Ride my bike. <laughs> Ride my bike and yoga. What book are you currently reading at the moment? <laughs> I am currently reading in front of me, Yoga Anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, I, I think I know the exact book that you've got. Cause I've, I've got it because well, my mum's just become a qualified yoga teacher. And so we've got all, oh. yeah, we've got all the yoga books around us. And I did my yoga qualification teaching course in India. Oh, amazing. Yeah, so we've got, we've got a, lot of the, a lot of the yoga books here. What is your favourite movie? Oh, favourite movie of all time, The Lost Boys. And music. What type of music do you listen to? <laughs> I listen to all sorts. I, I put together um, a playlist for Hand Soccer Britain and that people kind of um, contributed to as well. Some of the tunes on there are amazing. So I've got everything from The Lion King, which was featured uh, in my particular tough times on the road. The Lion King was something that came out. I love Swifty. So a lot of Taylor Swift on there. A bit of country, a bit of old school, 80s, 90s. Fleetwood Mac, Eagles, all sorts. Do you have like a mantra? Or I, th- I mean, I think you have mentioned your mantra, but is, is that like your main mantra or do you have any other sort of words that you live by? Um, well, I always say, yeah, dream big and live an adventure. Life is for living, isn't it? You've got to make the most of every single moment. So just get out there and just do everything you can to have no regrets. The ability to keep positive. You know, where do you think that comes from? I guess I'd always like to think that I've always been positive but I want to be positive I mean who wouldn't and I think particularly probably like the low times when I was in hospital you know uh, I say you have two choices but actually you don't have two choices do you you know what is the alternative to getting out there and just getting on with it so you've got to be positive and it's a much better place to be it feels good doesn't it final words of advice from you for other women out there who want to get into adventure they want to do more challenges they want to take a dream and an idea a dream and and turn it into a reality what advice would you have follow your dreams you know I know it sounds really cheesy but it's true if you want to do something then just go out there and do it it used to be that I'd ask my friends to kind of join in to go on trips to do this do that and very often you know everybody's got their own lives and they're busy and they can't do it but that's not a good reason not to do it for me, it came, well, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it on my own. And that was kind of the, I suppose, the turning point for me that, yes, I, I can do these things on my own. When I first went out with my wheelchair and thought, well, you know, can I get down this cliff face with my wheelchair? Yes, I can. Can I get back up a cliff face with my wheelchair? Probably not, but <laughs> you have to find a way to do it. And it's just going out there and learning. And I think going out there, doing it on your own is the best way to do that because you've got to figure it out and you it's so empowering to find out what you can do and when you find out what you can do you're going to find out what else you can do and then what else you can do and it's about growing that comfort zone and Mel where's the best place for people to find more information out about you and to follow along with your adventures you can follow me on social media so on twitter at dolly to racer on instagram at team dolly and on Facebook page and on my website, melnichols.co.uk. And Dolly, but just incidentally. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why Dolly? So my, my racing wheelchair is called Dolly. I'm on Dolly 4, I think, at the moment. They all look the same, a bit like Dolly the sheep. And she she's pink and orange, which are my, my colours. And so uh, when I first had her, when I chose those colours, everyone thought those colours were awful and they clashed so badly. But now everybody's going pink and orange but also I actually look like a dolly mixture hence dolly mel you are such an inspiration thank you so much for coming on the girl podcast to share more about your your life your challenges your adventures super excited to find out what the next adventure and challenge is going to be but best of luck with whatever it is thank you so much sarah Hey Tribe, I hope you are well and enjoyed the episode with Mel. So today is the 4th of August and I'm releasing four special episodes to help celebrate the fourth year birthday of the Tough Girl podcast. So the Tough Girl podcast was started on the 4th of August in 2015 with four episodes. So on the 4th of August in 2019, I'm releasing four episodes. So as well as listening to Mel, you can also listen to my solo episode where I reflect back on the Tough Girl Challenges journey, look back over 2018 and 2019. I also answer questions from the Tough Girl tribe and community. 
You can also take a listen to Paula Radcliffe, who is a British long distance runner. She's a three time winner of the London Marathon, three time New York Marathon champion, and a 2002 Chicago Marathon winner. She's the fastest female marathoner of all time and has held the Women's World Marathon record in a time of two hours. 15 minutes and 25 seconds. During her podcast episode, we talk more about her career, her passion for running, dealing with injury, becoming a mother and what she's up to now. You can also take a listen to Shamilia Kohistani, who grew up in Afghanistan under the Taliban rule. Shortly after the Taliban were removed from power, Shamilia began to play football or soccer as it's known in America. Shamilia, with the help of the Afghan Football Federation, was able to continue playing football and work to establish the first Afghan women's national football team in 2007. She was also proudly named captain of the women's national football team. So we've got a whole array of amazing episodes. So please do go check out toughgirlchallenges.com where you can find out more information about all of our previous guests, the different challenges and adventures that they've been on. Everything that we talked about today with Mel will be available in the show notes. And there's also links to her social media accounts. Just want to do a quick shout out to AK Mountain Dreamer. So I am very active on Instagram. You can come and follow me at toughgirlchallenges, but received a lovely message from her saying literally your podcast and your youtube episodes have changed my life i've watched your whole bike journey and you have made me so inspired to do it my husband loves your shows saying she's always so positive i'm guessing i'm already getting ready to watch your at journey i'm a hiker mother wife and nurse amongst other things my life is so busy so i just fit in the fun stuff and i'm enjoying it more now than i did when i was young i'm hiking as often as i can get off work Thank you for your positive encouragement and inspiration. You are amazing. So that's obviously a lovely, 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 lovely message to receive. And it makes me feel so happy to know that what I'm doing is being appreciated. And yeah, I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's financially supporting the Tough Girl podcast. We would not have got here without your monthly financial support. If you want to support the mission and help me to achieve another four years of the Tough Girl podcast, then please do go check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. You can find more information about supporting the podcast from $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month. It really does make a massive difference. Um, so if you listen, if you listen to the Tough Girl podcast every single week, please sign up as a patron. If it has changed your life in some way, then please sign up as a patron. If you feel motivated and inspired to take on a new challenge or adventure, please sign up as a patron. If you are currently on an adventure or challenge because you've been inspired by the Tough Girl podcast, then please sign up as a patron. It would be epic. So that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. New episodes come out on a Tuesday at 7am UK time. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. All that's left for me to say is have an amazing day. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it 110%. Give it your all. Take your first step. Know that I believe in you. Go for it. Dream big. Make it happen. Have an awesome day and I'll be back with you soon. Take care. Lots of love. Bye. Bye.